in order uh, to cut down on the time that you will have for critical questions, <laughs> I'm going to read very slowly. <laughs> One thing that impressed me deeply as a student of Bill Poteets was the fact that he was, on his own admission, not a scholar in the sense that many are, namely in the sense of being an authority in the thought of some intellectual mentor, or worse still, blindly devoted to defending the work of any such figure. In this sense, he was not a Kierkegaardian, an Arendtian, or a Wittgensteinian, and although I will come back to this, I think he was not even a Polonian. This is not to say that he did not learn much from such figures, or even that he was not knocked off of his horse by some of them. As Stanley Cavell once described his encounter with J.L. Austin, an encounter he says that kept him from abandoning philosophy altogether. As I would put the matter, one reason that Bill did not become a scholar in the above sense is that he had a philosophical project that was uniquely his own. Of course, he rightly knew better than to pursue this project alone. He had learned from Descartes that philosophical pursuits outside of conversation were destined for disaster. So he pursued his project in conversation with his mentors, with Kierkegaard, with Wittgenstein, with Arendt, and with Polanyi. But just as importantly, perhaps more so, he pursued it with his students. Well, what was that project? Or perhaps better, what was it that so deeply captivated Poteet's philosophical interest, if not his personal passion? As I have rep reported elsewhere, Maynard Adams, Bill's colleague in the Department of Philosophy at Chapel Hill, described Poteet's encounter with Wittgenstein as having a jolting philosophical impact on him. Adams told me that he saw something happen to Bill during a series of faculty discussions on the recently published philosophical investigations. Maynard described this to me as the moment in which Bill found or was finding his philosophical voice. I would not doubt that s similar jolting moments occurred when Bill discovered Pascal and Kierkegaard, which I suppose was during the time he was here at Yale. I think all of us know something about such encounters as we too have struggled to find our philosophical voice. For many of us, that moment came with our encounter with Poteet. Bill, however, does not credit Wittgenstein as the one who jolted him most profoundly nor for that matter, and perhaps surprisingly, he does not credit Polanyi either. As he reports it, he was knocked off the horse of his own intellectual struggle against Descartes, modernity, the Enlightenment, and his own doubts and intellectual presumptions by someone who was not a philosopher, but a sculptor. It was his encounter with the artist Moustakos in Athens that precipitated what Bill described as his Orphic dismemberment. He says, this encounter made him realize that all categories no longer advanced his philosophical project. He had to make a new beginning. We might be tempted to think that Bill understood this call for a new beginning for new categories as a call to expand and elaborate Polanyi's epistemology. We might be tempted to think so by Bill's own words. After all, of course, Bill did call his magnum opus Polanyan Meditations. Does this suggest, therefore, that Bill was a Polanyan after all? To think so, I think, conceals the core of Bill's intellectual and personal project. There is textual evidence for this reading and against it. In addition to calling this work Polanyan Meditations, Bill makes a point in the early pages to single out his debt to Polanyi as profound and conspicuous. And surely Polanyi provided Bill with just the epistemological reform he was seeking. 
So I readily acknowledge that there is a way of reading Polanyan meditations that seems to support the view that Bill's primary interest was, like Polanyi's, epistemological. On the very first page of Polanyan meditations, he says that he will be asking a bedrock epistemological question. And he references Polanyi's interest in exploring substantial beliefs about the nature of things. Clearly, these remarks portend an epistemological agenda. But against this reading, and also in the same opening pages, he does not credit Polanyi with jolting him in the way that Moustakas did. So here's the puzzle. Potit was already familiar with the categories of personal knowledge. So why did he, this encounter with the sculptor call for new categories? Why did it call for going beyond Polanyi and for thinking what Bill described as heretofore unthinkable thoughts for him? Bill says that his Orphic dismemberment sent him down a radically new path. I don't doubt that this is at least partly true. But I am inclined to think that his jolting dismemberment as a, as a call to return to an old path, that is, I think of it as a kind of rediscovery of an earlier pursuit. I imagine that this, dis, this dismemberment in Athens had affected a corresponding remembrance or a return, or better, a refinding of something he had lost or almost lost sight of. But what was it that derailed him from this old path? I speculate that his passion for finding a way to, to get around the damaging effects of Descartes' failed search for epistemic certainty had seduced him into thinking that the bedrock problem for modernity was an epistemological one. This might well have misled him into thinking that the only viable way to respond to Descartes' metaphysical dualism was via epistemological reform. And for Descartes, of course, it was his epistemological problem of certainty that generated his mind-body problem. But something happened in Athens that jolted Bill into realizing that Descartes had gotten the relation between epistemology and ontology exactly backwards. If Descartes' mistake was to begin his meditations with epistemic questions that generated the metaphysical mind-body gap, perhaps the way to begin anew is to start with the person, or more precisely, with the ontology of the person. So even though Bill said he was going to deal with a, a bedrock epistemological question, the fact is he turned Descartes on his head. He realized that the bedrock question for human beings run deep, runs deeper than questions about knowing can reach. So he redressed the Cartesian problematic by beginning with the question, what kind of being is the knower? I think that Bill almost lost his way trying to provide an epistemic response to Descartes' implicit skepticism. And if we read between the lines, we see that he was acutely aware of the fact that the Cartesian failed search for certainty was deeply threatening to faith, his own faith. And so we can understand why he felt an urgency to address epistemological questions. He was asking, is there an alternative model of knowing available to us? Is there a way to avoid skepticism? I speculate that Bill's encounter with Polanyi must have seemed to him just exactly what he was looking for. And yet, Polanyi did not manage to affect the turn that occurred to Athens. Why? Well, as outrageous as it may sound, imagine that from me, I think his encounter with Polanyi may have encouraged him to continue down an old epistemic path. So what knocked him off this horse? Perhaps it was a horse, a bronze one, <laughs> or at least the idea that sheets of bronze, rocks, and trees can be vehicles for expressing spirit. This Orphic encounter shocked him into realizing how rocks and trees can be made to dance in response to the voice of poetry and the dynamic sounds of music, and I would add, to the sounds of the spoken word. 
I think this was this I think it was this encounter that awakened him from his epistemic obsession, or at least began his recovery from it. It was brought to term in the form of a sustained, intense, and creative writing project. I think he must have imagined his words as they turned in on themselves were unfolding in Polanyan meditations in the way that sheets of metal had unfolded in the hands of Mustakas. So it does not take long in reading the opening pages of Polanyan meditations to see clearly that what he calls his bedrock epistemological question goes deeper than what we might call the standard philosophical project of epistemology. That is, the project of justifying our beliefs about the nature of things. Of course, I do not suggest that he had no interest in questions of knowing, but rather that such questions were giving way to a deeper bedrock, to deeper bedrock questions. As the pages unfold, it is clear that Bill was turning from his proposal to ask a bedrock epistemological question to asking what I would call his proposal to ask a question of where is Jim Steins when you need him? Fundamental ontology. That is, to the question of the nature of human being in the world. I call this his recovery of the primacy of fundamental ontology. Although I am happy to, to characterize his turn to the primacy of the person as a turn back to fundamental ontology, Bill's analysis of personal existence was significantly different, I will get to this in a minute, from Heidegger's. The project of writing Polanyan meditation seems to be characterized best as an instance of the way our words and our bodies are essentially connected. I might even say that in the writing process, Bill's words gust forth as though Bill were spilling his guts, and indeed it was a gush that took place over a short three-month period. I imagine the process as a time in which Bill finally refound his voice. Like Escher's hands, Bill's words turned in on themselves in his struggle to say what saying is, to trace them back to their bodily origin. This return to fundamental ontology found its full expression in his last book, Recovering the Ground. But the point I want to make is that this was not just a recovery of the ground of knowing. Nor was it simply the recovery, recovery of the ground of doing and saying. It was the recovery of the ground of a multitude of self-world relations, the ground of all meaning and meaning discernment. This turn, as I like to think of it, this turn back to fundamental ontology needs some clarification. It might be observed that the coupling of knowing and being is already present in Polanyi, and accordingly Polanyi may simply be, Potit may simply be elaborating the ontological element in ta of tacit knowing. Perhaps he was trying to complete a post-critical epistemology with a corresponding post-critical uh, ontology. After all, one important way to read Polanyi's epistemological reform is to understand him as showing that knowing that is finally grounded in knowing how, and as such, ultimately in bodily skills. So perhaps Poteet was simply continuing this Polanyan agenda. Let me issue some reservations I have about this. To do this, let me go out on a limb or perhaps out on another one. <laughs> when I speak of Poteet's interest in the primacy of persons, I suggest we need to see an inter this interest as ontological rather than as metaphysical. For me, ontology determines epistemology and lots more whereas metaphysics is determined solely by epistemology. As I read him, Polanyi's emphasis on the ontological does not seem to move much beyond the metaphysical as I have just characterized it. 
For him, the ontological is just the two-pole in the from-to structure of tacit knowing. So we meet this important difference. Bill's bedrock interest was in fundamental ontology, not in metaphysics. And I think it was from the beginning for him. He was interested in the fundamental ontology of the person as the ground of our myriad self-world relations, including knowing, but not confined to it. On the other hand, Polanyi's bedrock interest was primarily in epistemology, and his interest in ontology was confined to the metaphysical objects of knowledge and to the being of the knower. Strangely enough, this places Polanyi squarely in the ballpark with current philosophical debates regarding epistemology and metaphysics, debates about subjectivism, objectivism, skepticism, realism, anti-realism. Bill, I think, found a way around these debates, or I was put it, or as I would put it, a way of dethroning epistemology, along with its metaphysical mistress. I would call this Bill's most subtle and profound philosophical coup. In the grip of epistemic obsession, we are inclined to level all of our various self-world activities into modes of knowing. As I read him, I think Polanyi may have made this move and Bill came close to doing it himself. Now, I applaud Polanyi's expansion of the concept of knowing beyond its propositional forms of knowing that. In a parody of what Aristotle says about being, to wit that it is said in many ways, Polanyi wanted to show that knowing is said in many ways. We do know that just as we know how in a skillful, skillful performance, and just as we know by acquaintance or by heart, or perhaps we even know in as knowing something in our hearts. I, for one, am grateful for Polanyi's dethroning epistemolo epistemologist's obsession with knowing that. But did he go far enough? That is, did he fail to see that he was nevertheless still in the grip of an epistemic obsession. Suppose I am sitting on the beach, something I often do in Florida, and I am enjoying a beautiful sunset. It would seem that Polanyi might say that this is an instance of tacit knowing. If all he means by this is that I am conscious and that this involves subsidiary and focal awareness, well then I'm okay with that. But why call this tacit knowing? Is it knowing of any kind? Is it a matter of knowing that, how, by, in, and so forth? I see no reason to say that it is, and reason enough to say that it isn't. Now let me just track here a grammatical remark that Wittgenstein makes. He alerts us that we cannot use knowing any way we want to. So he says that in our usual, if we pay attention to the way we usually uh, use the word know, we will find out something about what it is to know something. As I read him, he suggests that when someone claims to know that P, it seems appropriate to ask, how did you find out? Well, when all conscious activities are hijacked by epistemology, then it seems that all my conscious activities are projects of finding something out. Yet when I look at and appreciate the sunset, I do not seem to be engaged in the epistemological project of finding something out. Do I find out that this is a sunset? <laughs> that it is beautiful? I think of G.E. Moore. Do I find out that I have a hand by raising it and looking at it or holding it up? So Wittgenstein wonders whether it makes sense to call this a case of knowing, just as he did with regard to his claim that a person cannot know that he is or she is in pain. When I am awake and just looking around, am I finding out that there is an external world? Am I solving an epistemological problem? Now, to put this in a more Polanyan idiom, I need to ask, when I am involved in any conscious activity and am I ipso facto involved in integrating clues into comprehensive entities? 
I wonder, would a Polanyan say that he or she found out that this is a sunset by integrating clues, solving a problem, as it were, constructing particulars into this comprehensive entity? And even though it is very helpful in deflecting the hegemony of knowing that, we do not dethrone epistemology by distinguishing between knowing that and knowing how, or even by distinguishing between knowing of the head and knowing of the heart, or what is sometimes called knowing by acquaintance. In the case of knowing how, the question that is invited is, how did you acquire this skill? Apprenticeship is the usual answer. But the assumption here is that such an acquisition is a matter of competence that some are better than others, that there can be masters of it. But does it make sense to be a master of going for a walk or more profoundly being a master speaker? And I do not here mean simply speaking well, but simply speaking. Some of us appreciate sunsets, but we don't have contests to see who is best at appreciating <laughs> them, I don't think. Uh, and, and the same can be said for entering a conversation, praying, making love, recognizing a hand. But then these are just a few of the myriad self-world activities that do not seem, at least to me, to be modes of knowing that, knowing how, knowing by, or even acknowledgement. So why should we want to avoid the move to reduce all consciousness uh, to modalities of knowing? Well, perhaps I consent this might be harmless. But perhaps, Polanyi notwithstanding, we cannot at this late date stem the tide of, of a persistent epistemic reduction and its metaphysical companion. I say this because naturalism is alive and well, and if we start with this model of knowing as a process of perpetually finding things out, of gathering and processing data, we end up with a materialistic image of the human as a computer run by a program, a kind of hardware software being rather than a mind body. And just as dangerous is the epistemic presumption that we can attain to a view from nowhere. The turn to fundamental ontology might well avoid this epi epistemic reduction. This is what Bill did with an unusual intensity. He did not lay down conditions in advance of his inquiry. He simply paid attention to his own embodiment, to how his words are formed, and to the contingent world we live and move and have our being in. Without any epistemic pre preemption, uh, he simply paid attention to his own lively mind-body having been stunned by how stones and bronze can come alive. So I hope you can see why I think that Polanyi might have tempted Bill to go down what I might call a path of epistemic leveling. But to his credit, Bill finally resisted. He did this by paying attention to fundamental ontology starting with his own. And even though it provided him with a way around thinking of the human as a ghost in the machine, he did not con conclude by denying the dual nature of persons. He found a new term for it. That term for the dual nature was his signature concept of the mind-body. For him, it is the mind-body that speaks, that goes for jogs, that dances, that feels, that knows, that hopes, that loves, that prays, that tells stories, asks questions, describes things, that, emphasize, that empathizes with others, that engages in political action, that appreciates sunsets. His ontological question, quest comes to term in the mind-body as the ground of all of our self-world activities, including knowing. I note here that while I see the rhetorical force of running the words mind and body together, I do not think this was necessary in order to make his point. I would have been happy if he had put a hyphen between mind and body, if that were clearly understood as the same hyphen we find in Buber's I-Thou relation. 
the hyphen would then serve to distinguish mind and body while connecting them essentially as ontologically co-constituted. If we do not make it clear that our minds are distinct and inseparable from our bodies, we might be led, as Bill was, into saying things I take to be unhappy, like muscles make assumptions. Bill managed to put his own unique stamp on questions of fundamental ontology. Bill's ontological project was, as I said earlier, different than Heidegger's. Heidegger, you know, said in the early work, there can be no such thing as a Christian philosophy. I want to conclude with a brief remark about this difference. Uh, he thought, Heidegger thought questions of fundamental ontology must be open in a way that Christian commitments would close off. However, I think that Bill managed to avoid such a closure. He did so not by providing Christian answers to questions of fundamental ontology, but by describing how Christianity provided us with a picture of ourselves worth our consideration, if not our existential embrace. That picture derives from the event, I think, as has been well said here, the event of the incarnation of Christ. Something that Bill thought of as bringing radically new possibilities for understanding our human existence. In the end, I do not think that there is any better way to understand what Bill was getting at in his concept of the mind-body than to see it as parallel to the God-man. This is pure speculation. However, I can't help but believe that Bill's recovery of his own embodied spirit was also for him a recovery of a Christian faith formed in his early life but shaken by the forces of modernity. I think of, of I think all of his mentors, Polanyi, Wittgenstein, and all the rest, but especially the events of Athens, helped him greatly in making a return to faith once again available. But I would single out, as Bill does, Kierkegaard on this matter. He took deadly seriously Kierkegaard's claim that man's essential idea is spirit and that we should not allow ourselves to be confused by the fact that she walks on two legs. He embraced Kierkegaard's dialectic, which held that Christianity brought sensuousness into the world via a spiritual exclusion of it. He embraced Kierkegaard's insights about historical consciousness and followed his head lead in praising language as the most perfect medium for expressing the paradoxical dualities of the God-man, spirit, flesh, mind, body. Now I really do conclude. To appreciate Bill's, Bill Poteet's legacy is finally to see that he was not primarily an epistemologist, but rather that he was a Christian ontologist. I add Christian here to suggest that Bill never abandoned his Christian upbringing. Given his immediate and extended family, how could he? I think these Christian influences shaped and informed his early and mature insights about the impact of Christianity on human consciousness. And even though he started out teaching philosophy, he decided to pursue a PhD in religion and to devote his career to teaching it. This tells me, if I am not too bold to say, that the grip of the gospel claim that the word had become flesh and dwelt among us was deep in his soul. How appropriate that his words chronicling his own recovery of faith, have come to rest, not just to rest, in these halls of divinity, but to inspire future fellow strugglers. Break. Well, the way it came out is, is due in part to you. Partly, <laughs> <laughs> that, that's what I, what I meant about yep. the same. I think the, the, uh, the uh, 
hesitation I had about certain things has been well, well handled. So congratulations. Yeah, well, thank you. And, and, and what, one of the things, of course, is, the, is my being okay with the hyphen. Endash. The hyphen in my body? Yeah. yeah. It's interesting, you know, that I said yesterday in my presentation that mind body is not in Wikipedia, but body mind is in Wikipedia. As one word? Yes. No. With no hyphen. No. So I think the hyphen may be something that gets whittled away in the process of usage. Yeah. I, I always liked uh, Arendt's idea about a world that is, and, and a paradigm of that is sort of like a table that we're sitting at that both brings us together and yet separates us so that we're not sort of, you know, involved in a Wesson oil party. <laughs> <laughs> or, that was last night. I, I, that was last night. <laughs>